Have you ever, have you ever read a sign that said do not touch and then went ahead and touched whatever it was you weren't supposed to? Or have you ever been at an event and when the announcer said, okay, now you can silence your cell phones, please, you didn't silence your cell phone? You know, we're not very good at obeying directions. And you know that if you've ever been on an airplane, because it's not long after you've been sitting on an airplane that they will say, you know, it is a federal offense to tamper with, disable, or destroy a smoke detector on an airplane. Now, if you notice, they had to give you three different descriptions of how you're not supposed to mess with smoke detectors. I mean, if that doesn't reveal how bad we are at listening and obeying and, and, and following directions, I don't know what does. I don't know what else displays the sin of the world than the fact that on an airplane they have to tell you not to tamper with, disable, or destroy. This morning, as we think about obedience... We have to face facts and realize that we're very, not very good at obeying on our own. Uh, from the time that we're children, uh, we learn how not to obey. And so, if we're going to have any hope, we're going to need some help if we are to obey, especially if we're to obey God's commands. And that's why, that's why our obedience isn't up to us. It is only made possible by Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, our Lord. It is only by the work of Jesus that we're even able to obey and that the problem of our disobedience can be dealt with. And we will actually see that in the psalm, despite the fact that it does not talk about Jesus by name. Now, it does talk about the anointed one. And this is one of the phrases, this is actually, uh, that, that leads to the Hebrew idea of the Old Testament, the Messiah, Maybe you remember that song in the 2000s, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, you know that one? Well, it actually is from Scripture, the idea that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who has came to save and rescue Israel, to save God's people. In the New Testament, this actually continues, uh, but it's you, they use the Greek word, which is Christ, rather than the Hebrew word, which is Messiah. So when we say Jesus Christ, again, you've heard this before, but we're not, we're not saying his full name as if Christ were the last name of Jesus. We're we're simply identifying him by his title, that he is the Messiah, the one who came to redeem God's people, Israel. And so we see in this passage the promises of the Messiah who is to come, which is Jesus. Now, this uh, if you have a bulletin, you'll notice that the outline for the sermon may look a little different. If you go to the bulletin, you'll see that at the end of each of the points, it says verses, VV, And then it lists them a little bit different than what you might be used to, right? Because it says 1 through 5, and then it skips to 11 and 12. And it goes on and on, where it has kind of two sections. That's because this psalm is structured specifically where verses 1 through 10 are like a prayer to God, and verses 11 through 18 are kind of God's response to the prayer. And so we're going to handle the prayers and the responses together to get a full picture of what this psalm is teaching. So we first see, through verses 1 through 5 and 11 through 12, that that God sends us a prophet who reveals God's plans. Looking at verse 1, it says, Remember, O Lord, in David's favor all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. And here is what he vows. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob, Jacob being Israel. So David here is making a vow that he is going to build a house for the Lord, a temple for the Lord to dwell in. Now you may already know the story and you may not. Uh, If you want to look at it later, you can uh, write down it's in 2 Samuel 7. There in verses 1 through 3, David says, Now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king, that is David, said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now, he's referring to the ark here. Now, perhaps you know about the new Indiana Jones film, Some of you might even know about the first Indiana Jones film. 
the Raiders of the Lost Ark, okay? Now, I don't want to get too, you know, I'm not encouraging you to go watch it. It's an entertaining film. It doesn't get the Bible right in every place. But that's what they're searching for in that first Indiana Jones movie. They're searching for the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant. And now if we look at Scripture, we see that we know kind of what the Ark looks like. It's, a, it's more like a, it's a box, kind of a larger box that's made of, it tells us, acacia wood. And it's overlaid with gold. So it's not made out of gold, but it's overlaid with gold on the inside and the outside. It's got four feet to stand on the ground, and each of those feet has a ring so that they can run poles through them, which is how they carried the ark. Now, inside the ark, they placed the testimonies of God, which in the scripture is, is if you know the picture of Moses coming with the tablets that are written on them, what we call the Ten Commandments, those are placed in the ark. That's where they stay. And, it, and there's a cover on the ark. They call it the mercy seat. And it's made of pure gold. And on that cover, on that lid, there are two cherubim, which if you don't know what cherubim are, it just happens. Or maybe it was on purpose. I don't know. Cody may have planned it. That we sang holy, holy, holy this morning where it says the, seraph, the cherubim and the seraphim. These are types of, in scripture, it teaches spiritual beings that God created to worship him and to do his work in this world in the spiritual realm. And so the cherubim, which are mentioned several times in Scripture, are, are, are on the ark, and there's two of them. There's one on each side. And they, the picture of them is their wings are spread out over the ark, and they're facing each other. And it says, God says, that he will meet his people ab- above the mercy seat between the cherubim. So the ark, this box, this fancy gold box, is meant to represent the presence of God with his people. And so David is wanting to build a temple, a home for the ark of God, for his presence to dwell. Because he's living, he says, in a house of cedar, but still the ark is in a tent. So David, with all of his zeal, all of his devotion, at this time in the Bible is saying, I want to build a house for God. Now, if you know the rest of the story... David didn't get to build a house for God. In fact, after Nathan says, do whatever you will, God will be with you, Nathan hears from the Lord, and the Lord says, no, 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 no. Go tell David he's not to build me a house. Who is this guy that he's going to build me a house? He says, one is coming, a descendant of yours, who will build the house. Now, we now know, if you keep reading the Bible, right, that David's son Solomon is the king who will rule and build the temple. So David didn't get to, but he was seeking to be obedient Now, why was his obedience unsuccessful? Because he did not know God's plans. We need to know God's plans if we're going to be obedient. We need to know what we are to obey. And so we see that although David had been given a house from the Lord and wanted to give the Lord a house, it was not his job to do so. Now, look at verses 11 and 12. We're going to skip down. This is when the psalm turns to God's response to the psalm writer. And he says, it says, the Lord swore to David a sure oath. You see, David had given his vow, but it did not come to fruition. It did not get completed. It did not go as planned because he didn't know God's plan. But here it says that God gives a sure oath, one that will come to pass, that you can have confidence, that you can take to the bank. It says, from which, this oath, from which he will not turn back. And here's what he tells him. One of the sons of your body... I will set on your throne. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. Now this is where we see in Scripture, oftentimes there are prophecies or things that are going to come to pass. And there are oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. So there is something that's going to happen probably near or in David's lifetime that will accomplish what God promises here But there is a later promise that is coming. Now, the near one is pretty clear, right? If David's not going to build the house, who is? Solomon. So the one who is to come from your body, literally the fruit of your womb, which we've heard that fruit of the womb, which we've heard that phrase in other psalms that we've been studying. In this psalm, it's saying that Solomon is coming to do this. But, but there is one who is coming who is even greater. That's the far fulfillment. That is Jesus See, Jesus, in his messianic office, kind of has, there's kind of three aspects to Jesus' messianic office. From very early on in the church, they started recognizing this. 
that there, there are two or three offices in the Old Testament that we acknowledge, right? There's the prophet. You've probably heard of the prophet. There's the priest. You've heard of the priest. And there is the king. You've heard of the king. David is one of the kings. It is believed that in the New Testament we see that the Messiah is both, actually all, a prophet, a priest, and a king. He serves in all of those roles. And as the prophet, he is bringing God's word to us. He is revealing God's plans. He is, he is uncovering what has been covered. He is revealing what has been hidden so that we can know what God is doing, so that we can know what God is expecting. And so we see that Although David is unable to be obedient because he doesn't even know God's plans, God is able to do through David exactly what he plans. And he is going to bring about one who is even more obedient than David, more obedient than Solomon. He is going to bring Jesus, who is completely obedient to God's word. Now, if you look at verse 12, there's a little bit more to this promise. And this part isn't as clear because it's conditional. There's conditions on it. It says, If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies, that is my my promise to relationship with you and my commands that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. Now, if you're not aware, Solomon was the last king from David's line to sit on the throne before the throne was divided. And the kingdoms split. And then all of a sudden, there are two whole kingdoms. There was Israel, Jacob down here, and there was Judah. This promise did not get kept. But it wasn't because of God's failure. It was because of the king's failure, David's descendants. It was their failure to obey, to keep God's covenant, to keep his promises that led to them not sitting on the throne forever. But God in his mercy has sent one. Jesus Christ, who is fully obedient and will and has and will continue to sit on his throne forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. And so we see God making promises that he can actually keep. Jesus is the prophet greater than Moses who reveals God's hidden plan. And this, to me, leads me to this conclusion We need to be very careful about what we have faith in. We need to be very careful about when we think we're obeying God. Because David certainly thought he was obeying God when he wanted to build the temple. But God quickly said, no, that's not your job. You know, we can sometimes use faith as a way, kind of as a weapon, you know, we can say, well, you didn't have enough faith, or you had faith in the wrong things, or, or if you just had faith that God would do this, it would have happened. But we need to be very careful, because we're not called to trust in, or have faith in, or, or believe in with all our heart anything that God didn't promise. You know, you might, you might have faith, or you might have had faith that God would give you a, a great spouse one day. You know, you're not going to be very happy with God if you believe that, and then you don't get one. Yet nowhere in Scripture does he say, well, all of my children are going to be married. You know, you might be very upset with God if you have faith. Well, God is going to get me through this difficult situation in my job. He's going to fix it all. It's going to be, I'm going to be triumphant over this situation, and all will be good. And then it doesn't happen. And things actually just get worse and worse and worse. You're not going to be able to continue to have faith in God for very long if you're trusting in that, when he never promised your work life was going to be very easy. You might have faith that God will take your church of 100 and turn it into a church of 500, but nowhere in God's word does he ever promise to do that. And you're going to have a hard time keeping faith in God if you continue to put your faith in things he never promised. And so here we see that if we are to be obedient to God, we must know his plan, and we must trust his plan, and we shouldn't go beyond that. It's not that we don't seek to do great things for God that we're unsure of. We certainly should do that. But if they fail, we should certainly say, well, it wasn't God's will, and he never told us it was going to happen, and that's okay. I'm not saying don't, don't do what God is calling you to do, but if it's not expressly revealed by Jesus and his word, We should be very careful about what we credit God with or what we blame him for. 
So God sends us a prophet who will reveal his plan. Let's look at verses 6 through 9 and see how Jesus is our priest. Verses 6 through 9 says, Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jaar. Now, now the first one, Ephrathah, is, 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 is another word for Bethlehem. Now, if you don't notice this already, this is just a common thing in the Psalms. The words that you're used to in the other books of the Bible, they use the replacement words. I don't know if it's just a literary thing or a poetic thing, but they often do that. This is another name for Bethlehem, which is David's hometown, and it's also the birthplace of Jesus. So they heard of it in David's hometown, and they found it in the fields of Jaar. Again, Jaar is another name for a place that you probably have heard of less than Bethlehem, which is Kiriath-Jerim. Okay, Kiriath-Jerim, which is, an, which is was actually, in 1 Samuel 7, the ark ends up there, and it, gets, it stays there, not where God is saying it will eventually be. It stays there for 20 years. And David finally, we hear about it in 1 Chronicles 13, David finally goes back after 20 years and, and frees the ark and gets it back. So, they're saying all the way back in David's hometown, we've heard about the ark. We found it in these fields. We found it in this place where it's been stuck for 20 years, and we're getting the ark back. And we want to go. They, they want to be obedient to God and go to where his dwelling place is. And they see the ark as God's dwelling place. Now, I don't think anyone in the Old Testament or the New, well, maybe some people, but generally the message of the Old Testament and the New Testament is not that God is, is living in a specific place. It's a very pagan idea, actually. The, the pagans believed that they could build little idols, and maybe that was God, or maybe God dwelt in that. The, the gods, the multiple gods dwelt in that. That's not what they believe about the ark. It's not like it's a box that keeps God shut in. They just believe that we're, that is where God is specially present and specially at work with them. And so they want to go. They want to be faithful. We want to go to the dwelling place of God. We want to go and worship at his footstool. Again, the dwelling place of God is often called his footstool in Scripture, specifically referring to the ark, which David calls it that at one time, but also referring to the whole world. I, I think there's something humbling about the fact that they and we go simply to God's footstool to worship. It's a very humbling thing to know that it is far better to lay down at the footstool of God and worship than it is to stand on both feet with hundreds of people that we've trampled over beneath our feet. It is so much better to, to lower ourselves to the feet of God. So, we see in this passage that this group, this chorus, it's saying we, 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 are wanting to go and worship God at his footstool, at his dwelling place. And in verse 8 it says, Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Now, arise, O Lord, sounds like really commanding. Like we're trying to make God obedient. But it's actually just a, a callback, a reference, to when Moses and the Israelites are in the wilderness and they're following the ark. Whenever the ark would be moving, they'd say, Arise, O Lord. And whenever it would rest, they'd say, Return, O Lord. And that's in Numbers 10, if you want to look it up later. So in verse 8, that same story is being told. They're just trying to follow the presence of God and, and take him to where he wants to go. And they pray here in verse 9. They say, Let your priest be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. We're getting a picture of the whole community worshiping God. Uh, they want a joyful, righteous community standing before God in his dwelling place, worshiping him. But they can't do it on their own. They can't do it in their own strength. So they turn to the Lord in prayer. And that's what we see in verses 13 through 16 now. So we skip ahead a little bit and we see God establishing their worship. He says, for the Lord has chosen Zion, Zion referring to Jerusalem, the, the mount on which the temple was built. He has desired it for his dwelling place. Now quoting the Lord, it says, this is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. God establishes where he will dwell. And he's not going to stay in kiriath Jerim or Jaar. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to go to Mount Zion. He's going to dwell where he wants to dwell. And now when we look at the New Testament, we see that in the Gospel of John, John takes great lengths to communicate to us that the dwelling place of God is now among men. It is not in a box. 
It is not in a room or in a temple. It is in the person of Jesus Christ. It is the word of God dwelling in flesh among us. Literally, as as Cody said a couple weeks ago, tabernacled among us, templed among us. Later in in John chapter 2, he says, The the temple would be destroyed and it would be built back in three days. And then John says he's referring to the temple of his body. The dwelling of God comes with Jesus so that we can rightfully say that he is Emmanuel, God with us. And now, when he ascends, he sends his spirit to dwell in his people such that every one of us is in some sense, if we are in Christ, a house of of the Lord, a place where God dwells. So whenever we're worried or frightened or struggling in life and we ask God, where are you? We go to his word and we find, well, he's right with us. If we're in Christ, he is there. And in that, we're truly never alone. So God is establishing his dwelling place. Here it is Zion, and in the future we see that it is Jesus and it is us. And it's important, it's important that God, who is the one who chooses Zion, he chooses where he will dwell and where he will be worshipped. He determines his worship. He establishes his worship. It's important that we understand that God sets the standard, the tone, the, the things of our worship He sets the whole thing up. And and without him, we could not worship rightly. We we would be like the pagans, praying for for the gods to set the altar on fire, but it never does. But with God, we, we we can make that altar so damp, it's like it's drowned in the ocean. And yet when we pray for the fire to come, it does. Why? Because we have set our worship according to his standards, not our own. And that means for us that we are to submit to Jesus who is our great high priest. That we are to say that that the senior pastor is not the head of the church, the elders are not the head of the church, the members are not the head of the church. The only one who is head of the church, the scripture tells us, is Christ Jesus. And you can see very quickly in churches where people are attempting to be the head of a church. We can see very clearly when they are trying to usurp the place of God, when they are trying to take over and rule and reign. But here we see that those people are not the head. It is only Christ. And all those people are simply priests functioning under the great high priest. He establishes our worship. And so we should worship according to his standards. And yes, there's flexibility in that. You know, a First Baptist Church in Alcoa looks a lot different than a First Baptist Church in some of the countries in Africa or in Asia or Southeast Asia or Europe or South America or Antarctica if there's a First Baptist Church there. And if there isn't one, maybe that's a good mission project for you to do is to go establish a church in Antarctica. You can witness to the Eskimo. Well, there aren't Eskimos there, are there? No. So I guess just some scientists in a room, you can go worship with them. But yeah, there's flexibility there. Church is going to look a little different in different places. And there's flexibility in that that, that we may want to make choices on things that Scripture is silent about a little differently than other churches. But you know what? There's a lot of foundation for us in Scripture for how we are to worship God. And we see some of this very clearly. First of all, we're to be committed to the written Word of God. We're to be committed to the Bible, the Scriptures. We are to firmly establish our worship in them. Why? Well, they're profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be equipped for every good work. They're powerful. It says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And not only that, they are perpetual. They persevere. They persevere. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So so why do we base our sermons, why do we base our services on Scripture? Well, it's better than anything you or I could ever say, isn't it? I don't know about you, but there's not enough wisdom in my pinky finger to say anything of any value to any of you. But if we go to the Scriptures, and we read them, and we study them, and we discern them, 
There is so much value that we could never stop digging. We could never stop finding. We would just be continually reaping precious, precious, precious jewels from the Scripture. So we're committed to the Word of God. We're committed to fellowship. We're committed to taking the Lord's Supper. We're committed to confessing our sin. We're committed to prayer. We're committed to many practices that are found in Scripture, many commands of our worship that are in Scripture. And when we worship as our great high priest, Jesus Christ commands, it is far better than anything you or I could come up with. Look at verse 16, or sorry, 15. In this place, he's establishing worship in Zion. What does he say? I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. When God establishes his worship, he provides for every need. He centers them around bread, not just a bread like a meal, but the bread of life. Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. We are centered on Christ. All of our needs are met, we're taken care of, and we stand before God, and, and we have righteous leaders. We, we have saints who are joyful. They shout with joy. I don't know about you, uh, when I was younger, a lot of churches went through uh, what we call the worship wars, which was funny for me because I grew up in a church that in the early, early 2000s, they very quickly decided to have contemporary music. But the way they did it, and you may know churches that did this, was to start a separate service that had contemporary music. So they had a traditional service at 9 a.m. and a a contemporary service at 11 a.m. And they did that for years and years and years. And it was one of the first churches in our town to do that. So very quickly, the contemporary service grew like crazy. All All these younger people from all the churches wanted to hear that kind of music, and they all flocked there. But eventually, all the other churches in town added contemporary music. And not only did they add contemporary music, they replaced their traditional music with contemporary. So that what happened wasn't they added another service, they just completely changed their church. All the young people who came to our second service wanted to go back. They went back to their churches. They went back to the new churches. Whatever church had the best guitar soloist, the flashiest, whatever, that's where they were going. And all of a sudden, that second service that we had had for years started dwindling and dwindling and dwindling until the worship team finally said, we're tired of playing for almost nobody. So what happened was in the 2010s, actually 20-teens, it was around 15, 13, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there, the services joined. Now, most churches at this time that went through the worship wars about the style of music, they had already settled the issue. People had gone to the church. They all, whatever. This church had never done that. Why? They never fought about worship. They just added a different service for the young people. So what happened when they joined them was we had a worship war for the first time, 2014, 15, all these people were fighting. Ten years after every, all the Baptists had already fought about it and split and divided and whatever, but we were kind of late on the scene, and, and, and that happened. And what struck me about it the most was there are a lot of people, good, in many ways, hearted people, who were very critical of the contemporary service. And, and you all probably know my leanings. I, I like a good hymn more than anything else. But they were very critical of the contemporary service. And that's all fine and good, except if you're the kind of person who sits every Sunday when the music, the songs are even biblically based, and your arms are crossed, and your shoulders are hunched over, and your face is in a permanent frown, and you at most kind of mumble the song lyrics. You know, to be honest with you, if that's, how you, if that's how you worship the Lord, I don't care what your music preferences are. The scripture says that the saints shout for joy. It doesn't say the saints shout for joy when they get the kind of music they like. It doesn't say the saints shout for joy because they got the, the, the electric guitar over the acoustic or the keyboard over the piano or the drums are not the drums or the solo or the quartet or the choir. It says the saints shout for joy. For joy. Why? Because the one that they're shouting about is Jesus Christ. And for his sake, I don't know why we spend so much time fighting about these little things. And all the while, our faces in permanent frowns. That's not how worship should be. And I think at the moment that we find that we no longer sing for joy, we may very well need to ask ourselves, whose fault is that really? We should find joy in the Lord's worship 
especially when it's done biblically. Finally, this. God sends us a king who redeems and rules over his people. Verse 10 says, For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The anointed one being the Messiah, the Christ, the King, Jesus. Jesus is the anointed one. And he has come to redeem Israel and all the nations to rescue them from exile, from God's presence, from slavery to sin. And as Messiah, Jesus is a prophet greater than Moses. He is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And here he is a king in the line of David. And as king, he brings God's presence to us. The the prophets spoke God's word to his people The priest brought the people to God, and the king represented God to his people. And in Jesus Christ, all three happen, such that we have the Messiah. Now, this psalm was almost certainly written after the split in the kingdom of Israel. So so they know something that that we may not. Look at uh, verses uh, 17 and 18. It says, There I will make a horn to sprout for David. A horn representing the victory of the royalty, the the king being victorious. Now why does it have to sprout? Because the psalm writer knew that at this point, the kings were no longer in charge. They They were out of the land. They were no longer in Jerusalem. The kings were not ruling. And so the horn, representing the metaphor for Christ and his presence and his victory, has to sprout. It has to emerge. It has to come from where they did not expect it. And so, in praying that the Lord would not turn his face away, it says that the Lord, it is him, not us, who will make this Messiah come. And we know that he is is victorious. We know that he, he has clarity. He knows God's intentions. It says that I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. And his enemies I will clothe with shame. But on him, his crown will shine. He has glory. He has a crown. This king is able to obey where we failed. The horn representing his victory over sin, over the disobedience to God. He he has a lamp to light his way. He knows how to obey God. And he has a crown. He has been given a symbol of glory for his success in obedience. This is so important for us because if we are going to have victory over sin, if we are going to obey God, we need to be freed. We need to be freed from the sin that rules in our hearts. We need to be freed from the disobedience that leads us away from God. We need to be freed to follow Jesus fully. We need Jesus to come and in his death, deal with our sin. And in his resurrection, show us that he conquered it. And now as he sends his spirit to work and dwell among us, we can have the victory over sin and death like Christ did. We can obey, not from our own efforts, not because we were raised real well in a real good home, not because we had a great education at the public school, Uh, Not because morality was so above and beyond in our time. No, we can obey simply because we have Jesus Christ. And it is in Jesus Christ that we have a prophet who can reveal God's plan and put us on a direction of obedience. It's pretty simple to know whether we are obeying God. Are, Are we living according to the revelation of Jesus Christ and the commands of his word? In Jesus Christ, we have a priest who can identify with our weakness but who never failed to obey God. He never sinned. He can be a sacrifice in our place and also the priest who makes the sacrifice for us. His death takes the penalty for our sins so that we can be freed from the grips of sin and death. And in Jesus Christ, we have a king who redeems us and now rules over every part of our lives, not just part of our lives, every part of our lives. He has shown us how to obey by his example, but More importantly, he has made our obedience possible by conquering the sin that ruled over us. We are no longer slaves to sin if we are in Christ. We are free. We can obey God right now, however imperfectly, because we have a Messiah. We have a Savior. We have a Lord. And let us turn to him in repentance today for where we have fallen so short 
of God and failed to obey. And let us turn to him in strength to face each and every day. Please pray with me.